want your face on uh, the recording, feel free to turn your camera off. We just want to make sure that we're sharing this out with as many people as possible, especially on a topic like we are talking about today. I know I'm very eager to get all the tips and tricks uh, from Katie on how to build my uh, LinkedIn profile for sure. So if you, if you don't want to be recorded, just turn your camera off. Okay, great. So I'm going to share my screen with you now, I hope, and you'll let me know if I'm succeeding. Um, okay, let's see. Oh, and Katie, if you just want to let people know that this might go over the yeah. hour too. Yeah, great. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, oops. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, so I'm really excited to be with you all to talk about owning your story on LinkedIn. Some of you I recognize as being connectors, so maybe you're not job hunting. I think there are a lot of job hunters on, on the call as well. Um, we are going to be talking about owning your story on LinkedIn, putting it to work for you for whatever you want. If you're a job hunting, uh, but maybe if you want to be you know, looking for a promotion at the place that you currently work, perhaps you work for yourself like I do, and you're using LinkedIn to communicate with prospective clients, or you're using it to win new business or, or grow existing clients. So you don't have to go find a new one. We're going to cover how you can use LinkedIn to do all of those things today. So I, I do want to just quickly start with some stage setting and housekeeping. And in the housekeeping, I'll mention you know, what you can expect. Um, stage setting. So for anyone who's on this call who is job hunting, and that's why you've joined this recovery network, I really think it's, it's so important to open up with the fact that hiring is happening, right? Because I know that um, I have been somebody who has been looking for work. You know, I watched my husband at one point when he lost his job have to look for work. I work with clients every week who are looking for, for jobs. And I, I know how stressful uh, and demoralizing it can be at different points. So I think it's really important to set the stage to say that I see my own clients getting jobs. My sister-in-law just got hired. She's in Massachusetts. She got hired virtually for this amazing job in uh, Seattle. Um, you know, so I see clients posting jobs, they're looking to hire. So I really do want to set the stage by saying, you know, we look at the dismal numbers in the news, but don't let the macro of what's going on in the world distract you from the fact that there's still opportunity, right? There's places like telemedicine and e-learning and a lot of CPG companies are, are doing very well. So I, I just want to set the stage by saying, if you're looking for work, you know, hang in there. Um, housekeeping. The session is billed as a power hour. It's probably gonna go a little bit longer than that. I am gonna be taking mo you know, the majority of the questions at the end. So if you need to leave because you're you know, on a lunch break from work or if you have other calls or, or kids at home that you need to help um, manage and you have to leave before you get to ask your question, please, please connect with me on LinkedIn send me an email, ask me what it is that you're curious about, and I will definitely get back to you. It may take me a few days, but I'm here to be a resource. So know that if you need to leave early. Uh, okay, so we're here today to talk about really owning your story uh, on LinkedIn, putting it to work for all the things that I talked about before, job hunting, clients, thought leadership, right? Maybe you want to um, be sourced for speaking opportunities or to be a media expert. LinkedIn is something that can help you with all of that. Um, quick intro, Jen shared that we, we connected when I presented at, an, um, I think it was actually, she runs it where we first met, but, and then I subsequently worked with her at Cap One. I run a, a career communications consultancy called the Reboot Group. So I work with clients and companies to um, make them more effective on LinkedIn so that they can better advocate for their career or their company, their priorities or their impact. Um, I have worked with probably 2,000. And <laughs> I hear somebody. Uh, I've probably, so this is actually a good uh, Hello, Judy. Maybe mute your mic if you're not speaking so that way everyone, um, you, we don't hear the barking dogs because that happened yesterday in my uh, yesterday's presentation. Um, so I, anyhow, I've worked with about 2,000 clients. I work with people either individually through one-on-one -on -one coaching engagements, or I do trainings and workshops at companies and organizations. So I, and I used to teach a class at linked, on LinkedIn at General Assembly um, in New York uh, twice a month before COVID. So I, I have literally been in front of, you know, hundreds of people in a room. I've been one-on-one -on -one with people on Zoom. And I, I know that when I say it's time to talk LinkedIn, that a lot of people are like, you know, it's like I've, I've said, it's time to go to the dentist. You know, we're going to like whip out our taxes and, and do all that stuff. And even though we know we have to do it, 
people are not excited about it. And I really want everyone on this call to be excited about LinkedIn and its possibility. Um, I always tell clients to think of LinkedIn as a megaphone, right? For most of us, uh, there's no easier, faster, cheaper, more efficient and effective way of truly reaching an enormous global audience. I'm not gonna walk through every one of these eye-popping numbers because I know you can read them. I do wanna call your attention though to 65 million business decision makers. And you know what a business decision maker is. It's the person that's gonna hire you, it's gonna promote you, it's going to become your client, give you budget. Um, and um, you know, help you with what it is that you want to do with your professional life. So this is a really wonderful platform for connecting with the people that are going to make a difference to you and your career. Um, okay, so to get the most out of this session, and whenever I work with a client one-on-one, -on -one, we always start with the end, right? So I want you to start with the end right now. I want you to be very clear about what it is that you want LinkedIn to do for you, and what personal success would look like in a month or three months. So, I, and I want you to be very um, kind of crisp about this. So don't just think, well, I'm here because I want a job, you know, or I want new clients. You have to be specific, you know, what type of job do you want? Are you looking to make a lateral move? Do you want a better salary? Do you want to be at a specific company? Are you hoping to pivot? I'm going to ask everybody to take 30 seconds and to actually write down what it is that you want LinkedIn to do for you. And, and be as specific as possible. Write it down on a piece of scrap paper or, or tap it into your phone if you don't have paper handy. All right, so let's begin. We'll take 30 seconds on this. Nathan, okay, now that you've articulated for yourself, you know, about where you want to be going and what you're hoping LinkedIn is going to do for you. Um, that's the first part of the equation, right? We create a strong LinkedIn profile, but LinkedIn only works when you put it to work, when you use it as a communications tool. So next you need to be asking yourself, who do I need to be communicating to, to realize my goal? And I, this is an important part of the equation because sometimes people think they need to get on LinkedIn and just talk to everybody. And they, they don't know what to share and they don't know what to post because they, they think they're talking to all 700 million people on LinkedIn. And the reality is that you need to be talking to a few specific people to advance your you know, de desired outcome. So if you're looking for a new job, you um, need to be speaking to hiring managers. But again, I would encourage you to think more specifically, like who do I need, these three companies I'd love to work at, who do I need to be communicating with? Is it a hiring manager? Is it somebody on the L&D team? Is it somebody in the marketing department? Like really get specific about who you need to be connecting with. Um, if I were to do this exercise and I were looking for work, I might say to myself, you know, I really need to reignite my, my network from CNN. I've let that kind of languish. So that would be um, a constituency of people that I need to start communicating with. So again, we'll take like 30, 60 seconds. I want you to jot down really specifically the people you need to be communicating with to realize your goals. And as you write these names down, um, think to yourself, this is a commitment you're making. You're making a commitment right now to start communicating with the people that you're identifying with right now. Okay, we'll take about 10 more seconds and then move on.
Okay. So now that you've thought, you know, very crisply about what do I want LinkedIn to do for me? What would success look like? Who who do I need to communicate to? We're going to talk about creating the your power profile and putting it to work so you can realize those objectives. So what we're going to cover during this session is why LinkedIn is a critical career tool, powering your story, which is really the most important part of your LinkedIn profile, you know, sharing the value that your work delivers to somebody, because that's how you get hired. That's how you win clients. We'll cover some tools and hacks to really use the platform effectively. And uh, at the end, we'll talk about content that delivers. When I say content that delivers, it's not just publishing articles or doing LinkedIn Lives. It's the kind of posting and engagement with your network and audience that really um, deepens and nurtures it. Okay, so I want us to do uh, a little stage setting. I love to show these women at the beginning of my um, presentations because we look at some women who crush it and we learn a lot from them. All of the women that you're seeing right now have enormous followings on LinkedIn, but that is not why I'm showing them to you. I'm showing them to you because they all do LinkedIn really well. So I would encourage you to follow these women because you'll see how they look and behave and communicate on the platform and it'll give you some ideas. Plus they share really interesting content. Uh, Kelly Hoey uh, uses her hashtag BYDN, Build Your Dream Network, it's her book. So she's created and leverages a custom hashtag. She talks about networking, investing. She repurposes content from her book and her podcast, which is really smart. If you have a book, if you create a, you know, a podcast, if you write articles, that's a lot of work. You wanna repurpose them on this platform. She takes her book, she breaks it down and she shares um, like little posts regularly, and she uses custom uh, customized um, graphics. So you always know it's hers when it shows up on your feed. She her graphics are always in yellow, black, and gray, and you know she trains her network to to know and identify her on their feed. Tiffany Dufu, who I'm sure a lot of people on this you know Zoom know, I really admire her work. She was a LinkedIn top voice last year. I have been sharing her in my presentations for probably three or four years now. When I first put her in, she had 5,000 followers. This was three years ago. She's now at 220,000 followers. You know, um, she's developed this enormous audience by sharing really interesting con uh, content that crosses sort of discipline. She talks about networking, women's leadership. She'll talk about Beyonce. You know, she talks about work-life balance. She has content franchises. She used to do video, which she sort of backed away from Tiffany's Epiphanies, but she uh, released a LinkedIn newsletter probably at the beginning of the year, and she's doing a regular monthly newsletter. All of her content that she shares drives her audience to the crew, which is the business that she launched. So she's a wonderful person to follow. She is using LinkedIn extremely effectively. Reshma Sajani, again, uh, when I first started following her, about 40,000 followers, she's now at 91. She's terrific because she really shares a, a mix of content. She mixes in uh, business, you know, Girls Who Code, her, her work on um, social justice, the women's pay gap, with really personal stuff too. She has a content franchise called Hashtag Failure Friday. Every Friday, she'll share a lesson that she learned. So she's somebody who's using the platform in really interesting ways and effectively mixing the personal and the professional. Finally, if you work for a big company or you want to, I recommend following Elizabeth Rutledge, who's the CMO of Amex. She really knocks it out of the park um, for Amex. She's a very active poster, sharing content one to, you know, to two times a week. She probably has a team helping her, but she is very smart about amplifying the um, messaging that you see on the Amex business page. Here's why that's important. Um, studies have shown that content shared by an individual gets like a 10X lift rate over that that's shared by a brand, which makes a lot of sense. We care about what people think, not what a big corporation thinks. So Elizabeth literally reshares the content from the American Express LinkedIn page and shares it out on her own profile. So this would be something that like Jen could do for Berlin Cameron, or if you work for a company, if you're resharing the content on your personal page, it's going to get uh, greater engagement and LinkedIn and Edelman did a, um, a trust index survey last year that shows that you also have uh, greater trust when the content comes from an individual. She's terrific about always at mentioning um, her clients and different uh, people at Amex, which allows her post to kind of live link to theirs, which increases its viral reach. So she's worth following as well. 
Okay, so let's dive into some of the nitty gritty about actually building your own network and putting it to work. So I want to start by saying that every single person on LinkedIn has two ways of building their network. And I share this with you because people don't always realize this. Uh, the two ways are by follow or by connect. Even though each person has both options, only one can be primary. So the primary option is the button that you're seeing in front of you. Um, if you were to click over to the dots or the more, you have the option of then um, choosing the other option. So Bill Gates has follow as his primary, but if I wanted to send him a connection request, I could do that by clicking open that dots and sending him a message. He is the most followed person on LinkedIn, by the way. Um, so if you're looking to build a really wide network to amplify your reach, you can consider switching over to follow because this encourages people who show up on your profile to follow you even if you're not connected. You know, I'm never gonna send Bill Gates a connection request, but if I wanna see his content, I can simply choose to follow him. The same is true with Mel Robbins. You know, she's a TV personality or she was, her show's off the air, but I, I follow her content. But a lot of times people don't re realize they can do that. So when they show up and they see connect as the main option, they move away because they think, I'm not gonna connect with Mel Robbins, right? I don't really know her. And they don't recognize that follow can be an option by clicking over there. So I share that with you so that you can do two things. One, you can recognize that you can follow people that you are not connected to. Uh, and two, you can ask yourself, how do I wanna show up on this platform? Do I wanna have people follow me or do I wanna have people connect with me? This is gonna be really an important distinction when you start job hunting uh, because uh, studies have shown that um, many jobs happen through second and third degree connections. So on LinkedIn, when you start to connect and pull in your first degree connections, um, the number of connections you have is important because it amplifies your ability to have second and third degree connections. So wh what does that mean? I'm, I'm showing you an example here. Um, the average LinkedIn user has about 930 connections. Many people have multiples of that. If you're looking to job hunt, you're going to want to make sure you've built up a robust um, network of first degree connections. And here's why. When I'm looking to job hunt, say I wanted to go work at Facebook, which is what you're looking at right now. This is a screen grab of Facebook's company page. Um, you can see right there, those three little heads are my first degree connections. I know three people who work at Facebook, but you can see that Facebook actually has 80,000 employees on LinkedIn or people who would work there. So if I were to click through that number to the 80,000, uh, LinkedIn serves me up a long list of people that I am second degree connections to, which you can see right here. So when I look at those second degree connections, when I see John, um, I see that my um, friend Eric is connected to him, and I see that my neighbor, Tim Mummers, is connected to him. So if I wanted to reach out to John, I might say, you know, hey, Tim, you know, you know that I work in the social good, social impact space. I would love to get connected to John. Is that something that you could make happen? So if I hadn't taken that step of making my neighbor Tim first degree connection, I would have lost the knowledge that there was this chance for him to be a door opener for me. So people often ask me like, how many connections should I have? And there really is no magic number, but you wanna make sure that you have a robust enough first degree network that you can then extend and, and, and use LinkedIn as a discovery tool, right? To reach second and third degree connections in your job hunt and when you look to source clients. Okay, so let's just dive into that. I wanted to set the stage by talking about the importance of networking, but let's dive into your profile and the importance of choosing powerful images. We're gonna start there. Um, head stop styles change. This is something that I review with clients. You wanna make sure that you're using images on your profile that align with how you wanna be seen today. We see an editorial style headshot. We see Beth Comstock, formerly of GE with a colored background. Una Tara Corpi, I always share her even though she's moved on because she was at Snapchat at the time and was using a Snapchat yellow background that worked with her cover image, right? That runs behind her. All of these women are using, um, making sophisticated use of imagery to telegraph you know, relevance and, and, uh, and that they're current. Um, cover image is another important um, uh, piece of your profile to pay attention to. This is the old way that LinkedIn uh, shares you know, the cover image if you're not using it, they've changed the way it looks. 
but you are gonna wanna make sure that you're paying attention to this because this is a little bit of a billboard, right? You can see that when I upload a color image that it improves the look and feel of my profile. This is what I actually use. It is the name of my company and my business services. So I'm putting this space to work for me. So it's telegraphing information to people when they're on my profile. Uh, you can see here the ClassPass uh, founder is using exercise imagery. Jen Rubio of Away is using their luggage. Uh, here's the CRO at Forbes using the magazine. But even if you don't have um, images like uh, uh, products to be sharing, if you want to telegraph that you're a speaker or a presenter, you could have images of you on stage. You could have images of you in a panel, right? You could have images of you in a podcasting booth. Things that are sharing information visually to the people looking at your profile. Uh, if you work for yourself and you have your own brand, you can and should be using your logo here. Um, even if you don't have specific images that are related to your professional work that you wanna share, you can see the difference it makes simply to upload color as this Lyft executive does and here this woman at Google. So look at your images and make sure they're um, you know, sharing with your network what you wanna be presenting. Okay, customize your URL. This is a little bit of housekeeping. LinkedIn gives you a default URL, the long number string. You want to tighten it up and have either your personal name or perhaps your business name. Mine says Katie Fogarty Media instead of just Katie Fogarty. This is important because with a shorter branded URL, you can put it into your email signature, which lets every email you send you know, share more professional information. And I, what, what oftentimes what happens is people customize this and they don't take the next, next step of putting in their email signature. Make sure your email's in there because it makes every email you send work a little harder. Okay, powering your headline. Your, your headline is my absolute favorite part of a LinkedIn profile. It's, it's, it's your elevator pitch, right? It's where you're introducing yourself to people and getting them to click your profile open. Um, Headlines have 120 type characters, that includes spaces. I really want you to think about going beyond your job title if you have one, or if you're a job hunter, you might not have a job title to be sharing. So we're gonna walk through a couple different styles of headlines. And so, because there's really no one size fits all, different headlines work for different people depending upon their needs. Here's my own headline. It says communications and career coach, LinkedIn reboot, transforming profiles and personal brands, host a certain age. So you can see that in this less than 120 characters, I have shared a lot of information. You know the type of work I do, I'm a communications coach. You have my business service, LinkedIn Reboot. You have a value proposition, I'm gonna transform, transform your profile and personal brands. And I also share that I host a podcast. Right, so you can really communicate a lot of information in your LinkedIn profile, in your LinkedIn headline, if you take it seriously. So company first, uh, if you work at a company and you want to be using your job title, uh, please make sure that you put your job uh, organization into your title. You can see here that Amy Fuller, the CMO of Accenture, we know she works there because it's in her headline, right? But uh, you can see these other chief marketing officers simply put CMO and we don't know where they work. Uh, Greg in the middle has taken the step of writing CMO at PepsiCo, and that gives me the information I need to know if I want to open up his profile. I don't know where Jonathan and Deirdre work, so I'm, I'm moving on because I'm busy, right? So if you want to use your actual headline, I mean, um, excuse me, your actual job title, put your organization in as well. If you want to go beyond your job title, which is what I encourage you to do, you can add keywords. So up top, we see Andrea Perez, who's the VP GM of Brand Jordan at Nike. That's her job title. She goes on to say senior marketing leader and a, mo a modern marketer who builds brands and drives growth, right? She's making a bit of a value statement. We see Jen, she was uh, lovely enough to let me share her headline, president of Ber Berlin Cameron, but she goes on to say she's a women's advocate, board mem member, public speaker. She's sharing like a 360 overview of what she does. And then we have global head of Fitbit Pay, innovation speaker lecture, I'm hiring, right? She's communicating a lot of information. So go beyond your job title if you can. Value emphasis. I love these headlines. They share the outcome that your work delivers. Jason Williams, gracious at Fitbit, let me use his headline. Global head of talent, building a high performance culture that wins through inclusion, engagement, and retention, right? He's making a sales pitch for working at Fitbit, very effective. 
Laura Belgray, I write the only newsletter anyone opens anymore, right? Boom. Like if you wanted a copywriter, you're going to pick her. And then I can't see Pam's because it's being hidden under my screen. I got to move it over. Um, but she too is making a value prop. I think she talks about her sales channel leadership. Okay. Oops. Why isn't this moving now? Okay. Roles first. This is going to be important for everybody on the call right now who does not have a job, so therefore does not have a job title. You can simply use keywords that refer to your past work. Uh, we see Kristen, recruiter, advisor, connector at LinkedIn. Interestingly, she actually works for LinkedIn, but she's just using keywords versus her job title. In the middle, we've got Sarah, who's a crackerjack copywriter and creative brand builder, right? She's saying copywriter, brand builder. We know what she does. And at the bottom, we have a novelist, memoirist, Atlantic columnist, photojournalist, right? These women are simply using keywords that describe the role that they do for their type of work. This is a great option if you don't have a job title. Uh, alum emphasis. This is increasingly becoming popular, particularly if you've left very big brands. This woman at Apple, uh, name check, she's an Uber alum. James says, you know, he's now at Fitbit, he's, but he's an ex-Googler. And we see the same thing with uh, the gentleman at MuleSoft. He used to work at Unilever, Google, and Facebook, and he says that he's an alum. So this is wonderful because this quickly credentials them and gets people excited about opening their profile. You know, name brands matter. So if you used to work at a big brand, uh, ask yourself, should I include that in my, um, my profile? Okay, eyeballs first. I, I share these because I absolutely love them because they show that you can be creative on LinkedIn. Cindy Gallup says, I like to blow shit up. I'm the Michael Bay of business. This is still, I've reviewed thousands and thousands of profiles. This has to be the most unique uh, LinkedIn headline that is on the platform of 700 million people. Um, but this is not something that you're going to be using if you're a job hunter, but it, it just demonstrates even even on something as corporate and template as a brain ambidextrous innovation director, right? He's actually at Salesforce, but he's talking about more his, his value props. He's creative, but analytical as well. Okay, so when you get off this call and you go look at your LinkedIn headline and think, you know, I need a new one and I'm ready to upgrade it, I would um, say to yourself, let me create three to six options. When I work with a client, we come up with 12 headlines. And if that feels daunting, it shouldn't. You know, sometimes it's harder to create the one perfect headline, but when you brainstorm out, you know, six to 12 different options, uh, it's easier to, to uh, sort of be creative. Once you've done that, really pick your, your top two to three favorite headlines and then crowdsource feedback from people who know you and your work well. Your headline is an elevator pitch. It's what you're communicating to other people. So you wanna hear what other people have to say. Mail the, your top three around, ask your friends, your advisors, your mentors, uh, which one would you pick as I look to refresh my profile? And this, this is an important question. What, if anything, am I missing in my headline? And you'll get some wonderful feedback. Okay, picture this. I wanna talk about more imagery on LinkedIn. We're gonna talk about the newish featured media section. And I say newish because it rolled out, it's probably been almost a year, but I still see many, many profiles that are not using it. So it hasn't fully taken hold. The featured media is what is, goes underneath your uh, headline, right? Your name, your headline, and then there's the featured media. It's a sliding carousel that allows you to put in unlimited media. You can do that here by adding, and you can add posts, articles, links, and, and media. You can also have, for the first time, clickable links in your featured media carousel right up top. So you see here uh, over to the left, it says story to tell, make yours amazing. That's a clickable link to my website. So if you have your personal website, if you have an author's website, you know, if you, have, uh, you wanna make a clickable link to like Berlin Cameron, you're gonna put that right here. I also have a clickable link to my podcast right here. LinkedIn did not offer this functionality of clickable links until featured media rolled out. Um, so it's wonderful. You can also, like I said, add posts, you can add articles, links, and media. Once you've uploaded those, you can edit uh, the order that they appear in and you can edit the copy that accompanies it by going onto the blue edit pen. Uh, it's, it's just important to know that the 
adding of content happens with a plus and the editing of content happens with the edit pen. I've had clients get confused, but they're, they're done in distinct um, spots. When you add this featured media to your, caras uh, to your carousel, it really allows you to spotlight your work and share kind of a 360 look at your work that's really critical for getting hired. Okay, optimizing keywords. We can't talk about LinkedIn without talking about keywords. I know you all know what keywords are, but you wanna make sure your profile is keyword rich. And I'm gonna talk about a couple of different ideas for doing that. You're gonna to wanna to use keywords in your headline, which we just saw. A little bit, we'll talk about our uh, experience in our about sections where you also wanna use keywords, but you really wanna build a well-developed skill section that shares your skills. And I've noticed that the more senior somebody is in their career, the less likely they are to have a robust skill section. I think it's perhaps because people feel like maybe it seems silly to list all your skills, but if you don't list all your skills, people do not know that you have them, you're not being found in search. So you wanna make sure you uh, build this out well. LinkedIn allows you to have up to 50 skills. People will often say, what skills should I add? My uh, tip for this is to get on LinkedIn itself. There are millions of active job postings on the platform every day. Find postings from a company that you want to work at, you know, maybe a Google, uh, find a job posting for a title that you'd like to have. And then I, I recommend physically printing those job postings out and then grabbing a pen and circling the keywords that you see in there. And then returning to your profile and putting those keywords into your profile where it's appropriate, where it makes sense. Uh, keywords change to so make sure you're current. And if you are a LinkedIn premium user, when you um, look at your premium, they do analytics, which show you where um, you're missing keywords vis-a-vis -a, -vis a job posting. So if you went into the job bar up at the top, you saw a job that you were interested in, you opened it up, LinkedIn will say, like you have seven of the top 10 skills you're looking for, and here are the three that you're missing. So then you know to add those to your profile. There's also a, a third party company called jobscan.co, uh, write that down, it, and it's .co, it's not .com. This is a third party tool that lets you, um, you give it permission to sync up with your LinkedIn profile. You will cut and paste three job specs into it that you're applying for. And then it runs a um, sort of a cross search and lets you know where you're missing certain keywords. So take the time, it's a little bit of housekeeping, but take the time to make sure your profile is keyword rich. Katie, can I stop you and just ask a quick question? Yeah, I'm looking please. at the, um, so there's some questions about if you add something under featured, does it get shared to your network's feed like a post would? Um, that's such a great question, no. But you, you can also, in your featured, you can add, um, you can add posts that you've done. So that's one of the things that you do. So if you posted something that got a lot of uh, attention and excitement, but it doesn't exist as an article or a video, you can actually pin that post into your featured carousel and it stays there. But that's a great question. No, you're not getting, LinkedIn's actually limited the amount of notifications that go out to your, your, your network. Because you know, in the past, if you've been on LinkedIn for a long time, remember like every time you added a skill or you add like change your photo, they would update your network and people were embarrassed. Mm -hmm. But many of those, um, those notifications have been limited. Um, but if you want your network to see it, you're gonna have to you know, post it and then put it in. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions on anything that we've covered so far before I move on? I feel like when I'm looking at the chat, you've you've answered a lot of them along okay. the way. So I'll, I'll make sure I, I keep checking. Okay, thanks, Julie, I appreciate it. Okay, so your experience section. So this is where you really wanna paint a full picture of all that you offer. This is critical if you're job hunting, but I would say it's critical for anybody. Uh, mistakes, that, we're not gonna talk about everything that you should be doing here, but I'm gonna to touch on some mistakes and opportunities. So mistakes is cutting and pasting your resume into here and thinking like that's enough. I encourage you to think of LinkedIn as a marketing document. It's where you're sharing a point of view about what your work offers and you're surfacing the most interesting things. Um, if you were to dump all of your resume in here, people are probably gonna move on, right? You wanna like sort of hook their attention and get them to wanna know more about you. Uh, structures that I often use with clients is we come up with an umbrella sentence, which is sort of a sentence that covers everything that you did in a role and contextualizes it. So that's, that's important too. contextualize your work, not like, 
I was responsible for bringing this product to market. You know, you could be saying during a time of like extreme challenging headwinds in the industry, you know, I was able to successfully launch three products to market that delivered, you know, X, right? So tell a tiny story in your sentence and then maybe have two to three bullets that would share metrics or, or details that bring that to life. Um, in your, if you've had a long, wonderful career, you can drop sort of way back roles. Uh, hiring managers really care most about what you've been doing lately in the last you know, five years, maybe 10 years. So you can, um, it doesn't have to be a comprehensive career overview. You can trim stuff from, from further back. Service offerings, you know, most of our world is virtual today. If you do, um, if you're a speaker and you're now like leading virtual webinars, you know, make sure that you're communicating that you're able to still provide your services in this new environment. Um, okay, I need to, how do I move this? Maybe somebody who's very Zoom savvy can help me. I can't see the bottom of the slide. Um, how do I do that? Okay. All right, well, you can see it. So you're looking at the last bullet, which I cannot. <laughs> uh, okay. Hey, Katie, it's titles and use keywords if that's, that's helpful. Oh, okay, oh yes. Okay, thank you so much, Missy. You're gonna be my reader. This is a team effort. You got uh, it. Thank you, team. So this is gonna bring me to the next slide. So in your titles and your keywords, remember how we talked about keywords in your LinkedIn headline and how it's important to have them there? You can optimize your job titles, right? So if you're a vice president of marketing and we've got no idea what kind of marketing you do, you can add that keyword you know, kind of behind it. And I'm gonna show you examples of that. Okay, so this is a screen grab of a real person, not a client, but somebody whose profile I admire. You can see what I've pulled out. Everything that you're seeing in yellow highlighted are keywords she's added to her titles. Right, so here at one point she was an EVP of marketing, but then she goes on to say consumer insight specialist. You know, when she was an SVP of marketing, there are a lot of SVPs of marketing. Like what was she doing in that role? She goes on to say franchise planner, ad sales teams. She's using keywords that, that expand on our knowledge of what she did in that role. The big call out that you see up top she was the CMO of Nick. You know, you would think that's that you know does enough heavy lifting. That's a big job, but she goes on to add keywords that say mobile app engagement leader, digital marketing strategist. Right? This is so smart for a couple of reasons. One, it optimizes her profile for search. Right? She's using keywords of things that people are looking for. Two, it helps give a top line overview of her work. Right? We're looking at this. This is a screen grab from a phone. So. Every, all the descriptors on mobile are hidden in drop down menus. But I don't even really actually need to open up any of these things to get a sense of what she did there. I, I have a top line overview of what she did in those jobs without even reading further. So she's making it easier for me to understand what she did, which is important, right? When you're job hunting, when you're communicating to people, you, yes, you wanna be discovered by algorithms, but at the end of the day, you get hired by people. So if you make it easy for people to understand what you did, that's like a really big part of the equation. So look at your own profile, ask yours, you don't have to do it everywhere, but look at some job titles that you've had in the past. Do they fully communicate the work you did? The answer is probably no, because a lot of job titles just are inadequate or don't capture the scope of what you did. Ask yourself, how can I optimize to, to share a more complete story? Okay. Um, okay. You can also declare your expertise, even if you don't have a job title. So this woman, Margaret Magnarelli, uh, lovely, she is the uh, executive director of growth marketing at Morgan Stanley. That's what's on the org chart, right? That's what she does for a job. But she goes on to paint a fuller picture by saying she's a keynote speaker on marketing topics. That is not on an org chart but she's put it into her experience block so we know she does this type of work. And then she, in the descriptor, she literally talks about the, the um, conferences and the titles of, of, the, of the speaking engagement she's done. So this is so smart. She is looking at her experience section. She's not being limited by what's on uh, her you know, business card. She is painting a fuller picture of the expertise that she offers to us. We see this, um, here as well with a woman at Facebook. This was her job. She was the director, head of industry, you know, global marketing solutions. That's on the org chart. But what she goes on to say is that she's a champion of women in leadership, right? 
That is not on a business card, but this is a big part of her professional offering. And she makes sure we know that because she puts it into her experience section. So when you click that open, you'll see that she was, you know, helped launch the Facebook Women Automotive Group and that she's done these networking events. She gives us more information about that, right? She doesn't bury this in her profile and hope we figure out she's a champion of women. She tells us she's a champion of women. So again, look at your profile and ask yourself, you know, am I really communicating all that I offer people? And think about whether or not you can employ one of these you know, devices to, to share that more fully. Okay, about section. This is uh, a really important part of your LinkedIn profile. I know you all know that. This used to be called the summary. It's now called the about. This is where you tell your professional story. And uh, like any good story, your uh, about section should be readable and engaging. And I'm starting with readable because that's the easiest. Um, make sure that you are using bullets and white space. Make sure that you are, you know, um, putting things into maybe fragments. You don't have to have complete sentences. If you open up an email and you see gigantic walls of text, you know, we tend to kind of move on. You want to make sure people can quickly read and scan because th th then they're more likely to pay attention. As I said earlier, 60 plus percentage of LinkedIn usage occurs via mobile. Make sure someone, look at your profile on your phone. Like when was the last time you looked at your own profile on your phone to make sure that somebody else looking at it can quickly and easily read what it is that they're seeing. So um, you can, if you look at my own LinkedIn summary, you'll see that I have, each one of my paragraphs is one sentence. It's one sentence, white space, one sentence, white space. You know, I'm not, no big dense blocks of text. And with a clear call to action, you know, connect with me here, visit my website here, tell people what to do next. So that's readable. Engaging is slightly trickier. Uh, this is where you're really telling your story. And I encourage you to look at your uh, LinkedIn about section and ask yourself, is the language that I'm sharing forward looking or is it about my past? You know, a lot of people treat this as like a comprehensive career overview. Like for, first I did this and then I did that and previously and before and before that. And it's just like a career snapshot. What they're failing to do is communicate what's gonna happen, what you offer to the person on the receiving end, right? You need to be answering the question, why you? You know, why me in your about section? The person looking at it needs to think to themselves, person is like going to help me. She's going to solve that business challenge. She's going to like, you know, get me clients, win me business, take this off my plate. The, you know, so you want to make sure that you're, you're looking forward. If you hire me together, we're going to do this. And so you want to make it forward looking. Then you know, the proof points about your ability to deliver on that promise, you know, are because you've worked in the past and you will reference work you've done. But um, you want to put yourself in the, uh, the hiring manager's shoes, the client's shoes, and say, am I communicating how I'm going to be helpful and, and the business challenges that I solve? Interject a little personality and passion into this, not like Facebook level passion, you know, no need to Instagram your salad or any of that stuff. But you want to explain like why you do the work you do, what lights you up, you know, and why you're working in this space. This is pretty, particularly critical if you're working in um, service offerings. You know, if you're a coach, if you are, um, you know, a writer, if you're an expert in a certain thing, you, you know, if you're in real estate, you know, if you're involved with a, um, a type of tr transaction that requires, you know, engendering trust. You know, this might not be financial services, right? Like you have to care about what your client cares about and you have to communicate why they should trust you to help. All right, Missy, I need your help. What's the bottom bullet? Can't read it. First two to three lines must pop. First two to three lines must pop. Okay, so this is really important. You are only looking at those first two to three lines when you see somebody's profile. Everything else is hidden in the drop down menu. This is also true on phones. No one is going to click open see more if you have not captured their attention in the first two to three lines, right? So you wanna make sure that you're hooking their attention and ideally if possible, that you're giving a snapshot in case they, they, they don't keep reading further. Cause maybe they are interested, but they're busy. So you wanna kind of, you know, it's, it's sort of, if there are any journalists here, like raise your hands. If you're, it's like, it's the whole notion of your, that lead paragraph gives you all the information 
and then the subsequent paragraphs expand on it, right? So you want the lead to either, you know, mine talks about like your story, kind of pulls you in, it asks a question and gets you thinking, oh my God, I, I do need this. Or you, or you wanna have a top line overview. And this woman, Andrea says, she's a modern, fearless, digitally savvy brand marketer with 15 years experience representing two of the most exciting consumer brands. We, we know a lot, 15 years, global, consumer, exciting. And then she goes on to say that she does, you know, digital, physical, global marketing programs, blah, blah, blah. We know a lot and she's, she's writing in an engaging way. So we will click open, see more to keep reading. Um, uh, I know clients sometimes think like it's really hard to tell your story and they worry about the language. Here's an example of something that is very short and very effective. She's an experienced advertising copywriter with two fully functional brain hemispheres. Right out of the gate, we know she's funny. Creative but strategic, imaginative but pragmatic, grasp the big picture, attentive to detail, can provide a kajillion stellar reviews, robust work ethic, healthy, healthy sense of humor. Now, how can I help you? Right? This is so engaging and it's short. It's short. It's not, it's not all over the place. She hasn't told us every other place she's ever written and how she went to, you know. She's really keeping it about the client. She's making it short, a little personality, some snappy language. If I'm looking for a copywriter, I would wanna work with her. So this is something that came across my screen a couple of months ago and I saved it and you're the first people seeing it, but I absolutely love this. You know, clarity is key. I think that a lot of times people think they need to use all the words on LinkedIn and you don't. And this is such a great example. We are an innovative, forward-thinking organization, cutting edge, you know, all this stuff. But really, we make telecommunication equipment. You know, clarity is key. You do not have to have all of the fuzzy, buzzy words. You simply need to explain to people what you do and why they should care. OK. Katie, can I interrupt just for a couple questions? Yeah. Uh, first person versus third person in the about. OK, that's such a great question. Thank you for answering it. I mean, asking it. Um, I would have said in the past, it should be first person. Everyone knows that individuals are writing this. We see the third person on corporate, you know, uh, in professional bios and on corporate websites, when you're, when you're, the corporation is the one that's speaking. You are speaking on LinkedIn. And so for many years, best practices was to use I. Plus, it, 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 when you use the word I, it builds, you know, trust, right? If I were up here saying, Katie Fogarty is a communications, you know, you would think I was a super weirdo. So that's why we use I when we communicate with people. Having said that, there has been a shift to using third person and the editor in chief of LinkedIn, for example, uses the third person. So I would say it's truly a matter of personal preference. You know, you used to read these articles that were saying, why are you using third person? That's, that's changed. So it's really whatever makes you feel most comfortable. Great, and then one other question. There's a, such a fine balance for job seekers between being professional, quote unquote, using business speak right. and being personally authentic. What, what are your suggestions there? You know, I, I really feel like we live in an age of um, like authenticity and transparency. And I, I just feel like it's also, but let's keep in mind, this is a professional network too. So we're not, you know, that, that always needs to be, uh, you know, at the top of, of, our, of our thinking. We are sharing our professional uh, story. We're sharing what lights us up professionally. We are not, you know, unless, our, you know, unless we're Cindy Gallup, we're not talking about blowing shit up on LinkedIn. Right, so you know, you, you know, you want to communicate uh, professionally about what the work that you do, you know. But if if um, injecting a little person, we saw this with with a copywriter, right? She she wasn't telling us about personal things, but she was sharing. Like, you know, she's a sense of humor, and it's important for her to share that. She probably wants to get hired by clients who like her, and I think that's really another thing that I would recommend, sort of big picture. It's like you want to sort of feel comfortable being your professional self because you wanna get hired by the people that you wanna work with. We've all had shitty bosses and wound up in bad cultures. You know, so you, you wanna, I think you wanna communicate in a way that gets you where you wanna go, which is to work with people where you're, that are gonna value you. I hope that's helpful. Great, thank you so much, very helpful. Okay, so leverage open to work. I wanna move, I know we have so much ground and we're, all, we're, 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 we're getting near the end, but so leveraging open to work. It, I have to talk about this because a lot of people on this call are job hunting actively. Um, LinkedIn offers something called open to work. It used to be called open candidate. So if you're wondering where that went, it's now open to work. So you'll find this on your own profile. You can see right now I'm in edit mode. 
on my personal profile. I know of an edit mode because there's an edit pen up in the, you know, the top right. Whenever you see these pens over here, you know that you're in edit mode. So when I'm in edit mode, this is where I add all my profile sections right here. And this is where I can add open to work. So if I were to click that open, it gives me these options, right? Show recruiters you're open to work or over there to the left, show you're hiring. So if you want a recruiter to know you're open to work, you're gonna click on this and open this up. You are gonna put in what kind of work are you open to? You're gonna add some keywords about your titles or the industry, maybe digital marketer, maybe it's you know branded content, whatever it is. Your locations, you're gonna put those in there. Then you're gonna click over here where it says, choose who can see this. This is where it gets interesting and people have to decide for themselves. Recruiters only or everybody on LinkedIn. Now in the past, it used to only be recruiters. Um, but when COVID happened and people, you know, the economy fell off a cliff and there was so much unemployment, LinkedIn added this new functionality called open to work, which lets everybody see that you're open to work because it puts a green frame around your headshot like this. I am open to work. You have probably seen this on LinkedIn. Uh, personally, I do not recommend clients do this. There is a bias against hiring people who are unemployed, which is unfortunate. And um, most of the clients that I work with are, you know, more senior. And so this sort of undercuts your seniority. Like in theory, everybody who is on LinkedIn is open to work. You know, you don't need, we're all open. So we don't need this frame, but this is a personal choice. Like if you really want to signal that you're open to work, you can consider using this. I also think it's a great choice for people who are like young, who are graduating maybe from grad schools or college, you know, who really like do need to signal that they're looking for work. But I, I would be concerned for the clientele that I work with about sharing this and the bias it might um, attract. Having said that, I, you know, it's a matter of personal preference. And there are a bunch of articles that you can go read and just, you know, I would educate yourself about whether it's working or it's not working and make your own choice. I'll, I'll mention him at the end of the, um, the presentation. There's a wonderful man on, on LinkedIn who works for LinkedIn. His name is Andrew Seaman, S-E-A-M-A-N. He publishes the Get Hired newsletter. They have fantastic, I would recommend subscribing to the newsletter, go to Andrew Seaman. You'll see his Get Hired newsletter, follow it. And then he shares a lot of information and he, he talks about the different functionality on LinkedIn as well. And he shared some articles about how people are using this and why it works. So you should go read those and make your own decision. But you will definitely want to at least signal that you, to recruiters that you're open to work. When I have taught classes before, I've had recruiters in the class. They have shared with me, they only ever talk to candidates who've, you know, who are using this functionality of recruiters only because they don't want to waste their time either. They'd rather talk to the thousand candidates who are interested versus maybe go surface 10,000 people who are not. So at bare minimum, you want to signal to recruiters and, and then you want to educate yourself about whether or not you want to add the green frame. Okay, so final um, bit of, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about how to be active, but this is really the biggest takeaway that I hope you leave with, that if you want LinkedIn to work for you, you really have to put the work in. It does not matter if you create an amazing profile and then you do not use it. You have to be active on LinkedIn. You have to share content, and we'll talk in a minute about what type of content you might share, and you have to network. You have to engage with the people in your life. You have to engage with the people that you want to meet. You have to let your network know that you're looking, let your network know that you're growing your client base. You need to let your network know you wanna be considered for speaking opportunities. Sometimes these things will fall into your lap, but they are more likely to land there if you are networking on the platform and, and signaling that you're open to opportunities. So uh, very quickly, LinkedIn itself recommends the three, two, one model for engagement. So three, two, one, when you're sharing content, and this is sort of a, a decent cadence to think about, when you're sharing content, you can share three pieces of content maybe that are interesting to your industry. You don't wanna be the person on LinkedIn always talking about themselves. So you're gonna be a resource. You're gonna share three pieces of content that are interesting to your network. You might share two pieces of content that are very specific about your company. Like, hey, did you know that we've added this new service? Cause that is still a service. And then maybe one kind of proud piece of content we won an award, you know, or I was on a panel or that type of thing. If you wanted to say something like I was on a panel, I would think about ways of making it be less about banging your own drum and more about being a resource. I was on a panel and the two panelists next to me shared the most amazing information. Did you know X, Y, and Z? 
because that's being a resource. Not everyone can be in every room, right? Not everyone can see everything. Think about ways of being valued to other people because that's really an important way of networking. Okay, so high engagement. Um, video is the number one engagement driver. It gets more interactions and more likes and comments than um, any other form of content. You can do LinkedIn Lives where you're you know, live streaming through a third party application like StreamYard. You, can, you have to apply for that, by the way. That's, that's in beta and it's not available to everyone, but you can apply to be considered for it. Uh, you can host LinkedIn events and you can do native video. Native video is where I'm talking to myself on my phone and I upload it and like we're off to the races. Um, and these are all options for you and they drive a lot of engagement. Having said that, you know, not everybody wants to share a video and, and I get that. So the good news is the second biggest driver of engagement on LinkedIn are short text only posts. So I wanna repeat that. Something that is three sentences long will get you a fair amount of engagement. Um, I posted an article a couple of months ago from the Wall Street Journal about ageism and job hunting. It had 12,000 views in like an hour. It was astonishing. And it took me five minutes. I said, can you believe that ageism and job hunting is still a thing? This article shares great tips. Boom. So that you don't have to create video. You don't have to host live events. You, know, you just have to post and be active with your network. Finally, um, this is sort of to incentivize you. Uh, the Edelman Trust, um, Edelman LinkedIn Trust Index survey that I referenced earlier, they did a lot of um, uh, sort of a dive into what type of content resonates. And they, they discovered, interestingly, that like almost 60% of people they talked to said that thought leadership awarded them impacting, you know, awarded them giving business. But only 13% of people on the giving end thought it mattered, right? So this is a big opportunity gap. You know, if, if, if more than half of the people you're talking to care about what you're talking about, but you're not talking because you think it doesn't matter, right? You're, you're missing this opportunity. So, I mean, look at like Jen De Silva, who does a wonderful job with thought leadership. She shares a lot of amazing content. And that is probably, you know, driving people to her because they love what she's doing and she's sharing. She's doing this well. But there are companies that are leaving and, and, and you know, people who are leaving opportunity on the table just simply because they don't think it matters. All right, Missy, my third bullet reader, what does it say? 54% 54, 54 of decision makers want snackable content, small but uh -huh. Yeah, so that's also good news, right? People are busy, so they want it short and sweet. They wanna be able to read something very quickly and understand why it matters. So again, this is good news. You do not have to write a big article. You don't have to write an essay. You can share a nugget of information um, pretty quickly. And that's the kind of content that people are actually looking for. Okay. High impact networking. The big headline here is be generous, right? Networking feels icky and transactional. People don't want to do it. People want to be generous. They want to be helpful. This entire Zoom session, this entire She Covery Network is, you know, is built on that notion. You want to be generous and helpful to people. That's actually how you grow your network. Um, if you want to bring some intentionality around it, which I would also encourage you to do, because we're all busy, we want to make sure our time on, on LinkedIn is giving us good ROI. You know, I would pick five to 10 key people that you want to know. These could be people who, whose work you admire or people who work in a vertical that you would love to ask a client base. Maybe you want to pivot your career and you're like, how can I be like her or do those things? Identify the five to 10 people, put them on a post-it note, stick it on your laptop, Follow, follow them if you're not connected and see what they post, like, comment, and share because that's what they care about, right? And that's how you start to build a relationship with them. I wound up on a stage a couple of years ago um, for the Ivy Launch Conference because I connected with Carol Fishman Cohen who runs it um, because we had a mutual third party connection and, and we, I, I cared about her content. I work with a lot of relaunchers and ultimately we would develop a relationship and I wound up on her stage. This was not, I didn't connect with her to wind up as a speaker. It just happened because we built a relationship. So figure out like, who, who do you want to know better? LinkedIn's a social network, or if, if it is if it's done well. I mean, there's 700 million people. You can't be social with all of them, but you don't need to be. You only need to be social with the people that are going to help you know, you, and you can be helpful with. Okay, use LinkedIn generously, write recommendations for people, make intros, write thank yous, you know, reshare their content. That's all wonderful. 
I would use it actively, set monthly you know, growth goals. If you have premium, they tell you your engagement. Right after this call, write down the number of connections you have, right? And then start using it actively and see if your numbers have grown. Because when you see that the, the, the numbers move, then you're more likely to want to use the platform because you're starting to see results from it. Missy, I, I hate that I keep asking you this. I have to figure out how to get all the people over here. If anyone's good on Zoom, you're going to help me later. What's the last one? Uh, the last one is under grow, follow as first step. If no direct connection, add LI URL to email. Okay, right. So those are things we already touched upon. Part of the way you're going to grow your network is you're going to follow people. They'll, if they're interested, they'll follow you back. You need to put your LinkedIn URL in your emails. We send a lot of email. People will, it's just a prompt for people to uh, wind up wa uh, wanting to connect with you and practice good LinkedIn hygiene. What does that mean? Like, you know, before you get on the call, when I appear on panels, I'll connect with the other panelists. Looking forward to being on the panel with you this week. You know, connect. Look, great to be on the panel with you. Connect, you know, um, I enjoyed your speech or after the meeting, before the call, you know, in, in, uh, connect intentionally. That's how your network will start to grow. Okay, job hunting resources before we wrap up and move into questions. We're in the home stretch, people. Andrew Seaman, I mentioned him, get hired newsletter on LinkedIn. I think the Muse, which is you know, directed to sort of a younger millennial and like Gen Z, has wonderful content. If you are job hunting, if you're like wondering about interviewing, negotiating, I would check there. Max List is actually out on the Pacific Northwest. He's got a really fabulous podcast about job hunting. Maxlist.com also shares information. He is a treasure trove of open jobs, but all in the Pacific Northwest. So if you're regional there, look for the job listings, but he shares wonderful content about, you know, everything you need to know about job hunting, you can learn there. I relaunch, if anyone on the call is a returner, if you've left, this is not just women, it's women and men. If you've had a long career break, you know, more than a year to care for children, you know, year, five, 10, most of their women, and because I think 90 something percent of their, their people are, are women, but most have had longer career breaks, either care for children, aging parents, or manage health, you know, crises. They share a lot of wonderful job hunting, but it's really, you know, geared towards people who have to deal with gaps on their resumes and gaps in their work history. So I, I recommend them as a resource. And Carrie Hannon, um, is also a wonderful, um, she writes for like CBS Market Watch. She's written a number of books on job hunting and a number of books on finance, but she's written a number of books on um, sort of second act careers, careers for aging people, careers for older women. And she shares a lot of great content as well. So I leave you with those resources. Um, and that's it. Thank you for, for being here after, it's only an hour uh, and eight. Um, Julie, it was, didn't, it didn't go as long as I was worried about. So we, we do have time for questions and I'm happy to answer them. I actually have a question. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie. Um, thank you so much. This was super helpful and, and eye opening and um, really appreciate you taking us through this. Um, I am personally looking to make a career transition. I work in account service on the agency side. So mm -hmm. from my experience, a lot of recruiters are 95% of the time reaching out for that exact role and the next level up, right? So if I'm looking for in-house marketing manager roles on the brand side, for example, how do mm -hmm. I write my bio or my headline to kind of you know, open me up to those sorts of searches from recruiters right. without kind of concerning my current employer. <laughs> right. Yes. Well, that's, well, that's one of the problems too, because sometimes people feel when they change their headline that, you know, job hunt is a, is a foot too. It's hard for me to answer that question without having like look specifically at your profile to understand, you know, where you've worked and, and, and what you've done, but, and, or what your existing headline is right now. But if there are, you know, if you, when you look at your job title, if you feel that there's some keywords that are missing, you know, maybe it's brand. I don't know. You could put that or agency relations or, or something of that, that, that might help. Yeah. Um, you, you know, know you now account supervisor at Wonderman Thompson wonder, and that just says agency all over it. So exactly something that <laughs> yeah. you want to consider like marketer, you know, adding some keywords like that to really start to look at expanding, um, you know, out of that. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. What, what I would also do too, whenever you're looking to make it like a transition too, is I, I would, I, you know, I do benchmarking for clients. So I would go look at the places where you want to work and see how the people there are talking about the work they do in their career and, and sort of be inspired about how you're probably doing some of those things or could, or so it gives you uh, ideas for adding language to your own profile that makes you look like a better fit. That's a great point. Thank you.
Katie, this is Franca. I have a quick question. Okay. Um, if you're in job search and under the profile piece where you're open to work, mm -hmm. there was a question about timing. Um, and I think there was two options immediately or no, I'm just browsing sort of thing. Right. Do you, you know, sort of like your opinion on don't make it open to everybody that you're open to work. Do you have an opinion on that? Um, if you're, if you're looking for work right now, I would make yourself, I would say I'm immediately looking for work and, and signal it just for the recruiters so that they know that you're, you're truly in job hunt mode. Not Great, just thank you. exploratory. And in terms of job hunting too, the, the, for the earlier question as well, you know, when you see people, I'm, I'm forget. Oh, Katie, I should, how could I forget that name? Uh, so, Katie, when you're looking to, to make a transition too, or even with working with recruiters, I would look to see who in your network recently like like left or how they made made a jump, and then you know connect with them and say, you know, I'm I'm looking, I'm kind of exploring the idea of being on the market. You know, did you work with anyone? Because sometimes recruiters are looking, they, they, recruiters work in certain, you know, spheres. And so you can get hooked up with a recruiter who's looking for your type of talent. So if you've seen people move, I would ask them, how'd you do that? You know, were you working with anybody? What, what tools did you use? How did that all happen? If you've seen people who like really left agency and went like more in-house and on the brand side. Mm -hmm. For sure, I feel like and a lot that's of for anybody. That's for any anybody in any industry, you know, because people sometimes wonder, like, should I be working with recruiters? Recruiters have to want to work with you, but you, you know, when you see people make a jump, I would say, how, you know, how that how that go? How'd you get there? And can you guide me, point me towards anybody? Great, thank you, Katie. There was a question about how often to post. I know you gave us the three, two, one. Um, Kind of reference, but how often would you recommend posting? You know, I think that people are busy running their, their day jobs. So I, I think you will, you want to make it easy. I, I would recommend trying to be active at least twice a week. And if you you know if you're just looking for, I mean, LinkedIn is a is a Monday through Friday platform predominantly. I haven't seen COVID's changed everything as we all know, but it used to be most active from seven to eight a.m. and then again later in the day, which makes sense because people were either commuting or kind of you know drinking coffee, looking at their computer on the way in and the way out. Uh, I haven't seen how that's changed because no one's commuting any longer and we're, we're all at home. But I, I still think that if you were to, were to think, let me post during the week. Tuesday through Thursday, which gets the biggest engagement. Like I tend not to post on Monday because people are busy. And so I do still try to stick to in the morning. So I, you know, I would post once a week where you're sharing content. And then once a week I would get on where you're spending time liking and commenting on other people's activity. And do it 10 minutes Tuesday morning, 10 minutes Thursday morning. You know, having said that, if an article crosses your screen that you want to share, I would go for it. If you know that you're on a panel, like something's happened where you want to let your network know, I would do that. But I would try to bring a little discipline around doing it at least twice a week, Tuesday through Thursday, make it a habit, you know, because then it sticks. Um, but I don't think you need to go crazy. And, you know, you, you don't want to annoy people either, but. Super helpful. Have, Thank you so much. They've also said too, like there, if you if you really care about like hacking algorithms, if you post thirty days in a row, like you know that, that improves in theory your algorithm. But I I don't I, I don't really believe in vanity metrics about like engagement and followers. You know, you 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 just want to be connected to the people that are going to make a difference for your career and what you want to be doing because that's it's it's the right network. It's not the biggest network. So hi, is it okay to ask a question? Sure. Sure. Um, so hi, thanks, Katie. This has been terrific. Um, uh, I just have one other question about posting because I struggle. I know that it's good to post and I always look to post, but I guess I fear that I'm not insightful enough or value adds so that I pull back. But I see lots of people posting things like, oh, it's such a great comment or, um, oh, you know, great idea. And I feel like those are really gratuitous, but <laughs> you know, that they just sort of want the credit for posting um, right. and because they're not really saying anything, but maybe not. Maybe that is a good thing to do and it gets them in the algorithm better. So I just curious your perspective on that. You know, I think that everyone should look and behave on LinkedIn in ways that feel comfortable. So I feel like, you know, if that's not something that you, you know, feel adds value, like I wouldn't do it. Like there, there's, there's no one size fits all for the way you behave on this platform and it should really feel comfortable because otherwise, you know, it's, it's not something that we're, we're going to do. 
you know, having, uh, having said that, I, I do think that um, liking and commenting other people's activity is generous because it helps their content rise higher. So anytime a single piece of content gets 30 pieces of engagement within the first hour, it surfaces higher in the algorithm. So, you know, it's nice to kind of help people lift their content up or to sort of to chime in. So, but if it, if it feels like gratuitous or weird, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it, you know. And in terms of what kind of content to share, I often recommend you set up a Google alert. So depending upon what you're in, you know, maybe it's, you know, job hunting or ageism and job hunting for me or whatever it might be. And when you, so interesting stuff will cross your screen that way and you can decide whether or not you want to share it, it helps. Um, I, I actually worked with a woman who worked in HR and it's funny because this is a big HR tool and she's like, I hate LinkedIn and I, I don't want to, you know, I can't post anything. I don't want to do that. And so we finally had a conversation and she finally said, you know, what I really care about is succession planning at organizations. And I'm like, well, post about that. Like every time you see an interesting, like, you know, handover or where it could have gone differently or, you know, just, so if you want to be known as the person who, who can help companies with succession planning, like share content about that because that, you don't have to talk about all the other stuff. This is the one thing that you're really kind of interested in and you really feel like you, you have a perspective on, you know, do that. I think it's just easier when you're sharing content on like two or three specific things, it's much easier than like, I could talk about anything because then we talk, we don't, you know, but pick the thing that you really, or that you care about and that you want your, that you want to be known for, that you want your network to know that you have an opinion on. Thanks. All right, this has been really fun. If there are any other questions, I'm happy to take them. Or if they come to you later when you get off, um, you know, please hit me up over uh, LinkedIn in mail. I'm happy to ask. I know that this presentation covers a lot of ground and you can feel like, oh my gosh, I have a lot of work to do. But I would say that you can, you can make big changes in very short time. You know, writing a new headline and adding some keywords will take you 10 minutes, mail it to three people take 10 minutes to you know, try to go find a job posting you like, add some skills, even if you're not actively hunting. You know, make sure that you've optimized your profile for keywords, that is not hard. And then next Tuesday, you know, commit yourself to sharing something with your network. These are three small activities that can take less than 15 minutes that will you know, start to drive some results for you. Thank you so much, Katie. This was an amazing presentation. Um, you did an awesome job. So, so many learnings. I can't wait to apply them to my own profile. It was great to be with you all. And for all the job hunters, I wish you, wish you good luck. Thank you, Katie. It's wonderful. Yes, and just for everyone else who's on, our next session will be on Monday um, on interview prep. It'll be at five o'clock central, six o'clock Eastern. More info will be posted in the LinkedIn site. And then next Wednesday, don't feel stuck, take command of your job search. So a couple great sessions coming up next week and we'll make sure to post those details. Thank you. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Thank you so much. Bye.